So I'm talking today with Paul Alavisados, our Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost here at UC Berkeley. Hi, Paul. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for sitting down with me today to share your leadership it's a story. Pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, you're a distinguished researcher and scholar in nanoscience and nanotechnology. You've won the National Academy of Sciences Award, among many other awards. You were ranked the fifth most, most influential chemist in the world. How does that academic background inform your role as a senior administrator and leader? <laughs> well, uh, I find the two to be very connected with each other. Uh, my my roles as a scientist have brought me a lot of understanding about what it means to be part of a community. Mm. What I've learned as a scientist over many years is that it's a very social activity and that if you're able to build up a strong community network that you're able to do much better as a scientist. Mm. And so much of my early efforts at being involved in creating community and building things in, came from you know those kinds of lessons and one followed another into this kind of position, Okay, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, so, I can imagine it's very collaborative work. It's very collaborative mm -hmm. work and creating a community requires uh, a certain mindset and a set of skills. And it involves helping the, um, the society around you to function in the best way it can. So that can lead you naturally into administration. So what defining moments have occurred in your life or your career, and how have they shaped you? Defining moments. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, you know, one of the things that's very interesting for me personally is that there are... Um, um, there's a great deal of unpredictability in what we end up doing in our lives, and then there's a few moments when things kind of crystallize. Yeah. So, as an example, I was a graduate student here, and when I left, my friends had a party for me, and they asked me, you know, Paul, what are you going to do when you, you know, when you leave? And um, I said. Uh, gosh, I really don't know, but if there's one thing I'm certain of, I will never be a professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 18 months later, I was back here and I was a professor, uh, mainly because along the way I found something I really loved and was very interested in. So to me, that was an interesting experience that I shared just because I think sometimes we get very um, convinced that we know exactly what path mm -hmm. we're on, but that's not always the case. Um, but I've, I've had some other moments where, for example, um, mentors have pointed me towards a direction and said that they thought I would be able to do something which I hadn't thought I could. So the, valuing of, uh, the value of mentoring comes up often in my interviews mm -hmm. with other leaders. Um, so that leads me to ask you, if you mentor people now, oh, yes. um, staff, and if you were mentoring a new staff member now, like what advice would you give them? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I will say that the more you come up in leadership, the more almost every interaction you have becomes part of mentorship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in a sense, you become a mentor to huge numbers of people in the community and you're asked to model behaviors that express community values. And, and, and if people see you evidencing those, it influences them in many ways. But yes, I do mentor a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, more as I've gotten further along. Um, so I think it's a really, um, it's a great thing to try to do. <laughs> And it enriches you each time you do that, especially if you're successful mm -hmm. in your mentorship. So I enjoy doing that. I still also have an active, you know, research group, and so I'm mentoring a number of students and postdocs at the same time as I'm involved in trying to mentor people who are in, you know, a variety of different stages of life and career, you mm -hmm. know, here on the campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a wonderful feeling to be involved in that. It's an interesting experience to try to think of how to be 
I, I often think back to that one mentorship event that I'm describing, which was a seminal one for me, because this person perceived something in me that I didn't. So I try to some degree to be able to do that. Were you ever able to share with that person what they meant to you when they did that? A little bit, but not as much as I should have. So, you know, it's, that opportunity's gone. That's a good lesson learned. It is a good Pass lesson along. learned. Yeah. So, Paul, what does being a leader mean to you? Oh. Well, I mean, for me, I think that um, it's very important to uh, be to feel like the community that you're involved in, that the, its values are ones that you share deeply. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to some level, for me, leadership means partly being having a very deep commitment to the values of that community, but also feeling a responsibility to try to help that community to see where it could go. <laughs> much as we talked about that mentorship example mm -hmm. where you know a person helped me see that I could do something. To me, one of the biggest roles of leadership is trying to help an entire community see where it could be in five and 10 and 15 years. You know, that's a very fundamental role of leadership. Presenting a vision? Presenting a vision or, or allowing the community to create the vision one way or the other, but mm -hmm. to be a part of helping shape that and um, helping the organization or the community not to become um, uh, locked in place or satisfied with where it is. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So every, every community needs to be changing all the time and change is a very, very hard thing. And so I think leaders need to play a really important role in catalyzing, prompting, promoting necessary change inside the organization and building understanding of why that's a good thing. So you and I have spoken before about the importance of leadership development. Yes. And I know we have some synchronous efforts going on right now on campus mm -hmm. to do leadership development both for our faculty mm -hmm. and also for our staff. Mm -hmm. So what do you hope comes of those efforts in developing yeah. leaders? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, I really think it's something we need to do very much more than what we have. Not that we don't have a lot of wonderful leaders around the campus, but uh, intentional helping people to get skills mm -hmm. so that as they enter into leadership positions, they're ready to be able to function well in them as opposed to learning you know, through a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. on, the, on the job really helps an organization to be much healthier. But I will say from the point of view of individuals, when they get that kind of leadership development, it opens up so many doors for them unexpected ones potentially, mm -hmm. but important ones. So I, I think it's a really healthy part of an organization to have leadership development integrated in, and I agree with you very much. It's just as important for staff as it is for faculty. And if we do it well, um, both our staff and our faculty will find many new areas where they can find fulfillment and be valuable you know, to us or even to others. Sure, thank you. Your role is very faculty and academic focused, mm -hmm. but in what ways do you try to connect with staff and understand their concerns and the role they play here? Yeah, well, first of all, let me say that during the time I've been in this role, um, as well as in the year when I was the vice chancellor for research, I had the opportunity to visit all kinds of parts of the campus uh, where there are staff mm -hmm. doing their work. And I'm, I'm just absolutely astonished by the commitment that the staff have to this place. Um, and it's very deep, they're very deep bonds that come because people really, what this place stands for speaks to them very directly. So um, if you try to think about what are the things that um, are essential to having a great Berkeley in five and 10 and 15 years, keeping you know, true to that 
uh, situation where the staff feel deeply connected is is one of our most important assets. We have to make sure that we keep that in place every way we can. Uh, I try my best to get out and about and meet a lot of staff mm -hmm. um, and to talk with them and to hear about what's going on with them. And um, you know, if there's one thing I have learned is that if you're in an office like this, you can get you can lose track of what's really happening inside mm -hmm. the organization because it's very large. Mm -hmm. All over this campus, wherever I go, I find people who are working so hard. And it's very important that uh, that, that be recognized and uh, that their bonds with the students and the faculty you know, be very strong. As many people are concerned that after several years of staff layoffs and a reduced workforce, mm -hmm. that we're not going to be able to continue to support our students and our faculty and maintain our levels of excellence that we've always been used to and expect mm -hmm. um, and want to be able to, to live up to. So what do you say to that as we embark on our strategic planning for the next several years? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I can understand that. And it's a very, it is a stressful moment. You know, it is a funny moment because... Um, on the one hand, it's important for people to know that um, in the last two years, we've really been um, quite disciplined and we've brought our budget deficit um, down in excess of what we had predicted we would do mm -hmm. each year. Okay. And that that means that we're on a very good track so that in uh, the 2020-2021 academic year, we'll have achieved you know financial uh, uh, stability. It's the power of strong ideas about what the future should be like that will help us be able to stay true to the public mm -hmm. mission of the university. And it is a very difficult period because there's a profound change in how we get financial support. Mm -hmm. But with good ideas, uh, there will be financial support for us to really stay true to the mission. And so what's what's required of us as a community from leadership all the way to you know every single staff member and student on the campus, what's needed is for us to think about what is a way in which we can keep true to our mission and our values, mm -hmm. uh, but be financially viable as we go along. And as we look out to the future, what I see is only more need for the kinds of things this university offers to society, uh, you know, educated mm -hmm. students, and the um, power of new ideas. Those are only more needed. Mm -hmm. So we should be able to make that work. And I think there's a lot of ways we can do it. I appreciate your optimism about yeah, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like yeah. that phrase, the power of new ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what have been the biggest lessons learned for you in your life? <laughs> lessons are so many. Um, you know, certainly I will say, I mean, I alluded earlier to how much respect I've come to have for communities of thinkers. And mm -hmm. if there's one thing that I have learned, it's that it's very, very important um, to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, because, um, and, and it's very important to listen um, to even voices that might appear to be quiet or don't immediately mm -hmm. uh, shout first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because very often that's where the best ideas will be. So you have to be patient, listen, and try to create an opening for everybody to be able to, to give their opinion. And to, when you do hear something, even if you at first disagree with it, it's very important to listen and think about it. Try to understand the perspective it comes from and reanalyze it over and over to see if maybe there is something in it that is right and to be correcting all the time. You know, in the world of science, we learn that. If we, um, we're, we're supposed to doubt ourselves constantly, uh, test every idea that we have, push against it, and be skeptical that our own idea might be right. Push against it, you know, in order to be accurate and mm -hmm. to be careful. And I've learned that that's just as true in an action set of activities that you might do in a leadership role. It's very important to have avenues where people can communicate and tell you what their ideas are and that, you know, that your own ideas may not be right. Interesting. So I see more and more applications of your science background to what you're doing now. I view them as completely integrated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes people wonder how can you remain active as a scientist and be working as an administrator? Mm -hmm. And to me, I see the two as kind of really, 
more or less exercising most of the same kinds of ways of thinking, but just in different spheres of life. Mm -hmm. You probably don't sleep much. I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you probably you know with age it's a little bit harder to sleep as mm -hmm. much. I, I, you know, I'm envious of young people who can really sleep for many hours. <laughs> yeah. Paul, what are you most grateful for? Oh, I'm deeply grateful for um, you know um, for family. I mean, so you know, but leaving that aside for the moment, I'm just talking about professional life I'm really grateful for having found my way to Berkeley mm -hmm. I you know it's a very special place so that I, I really do feel it's an amazing place and I'm very grateful thank you is there anything that, that you'd like to share with our Wisdom Cafe audience that we haven't talked about? Uh, well, um, I'm really glad that you have a Wisdom Cafe because we need a lot of wisdom. <laughs> and so drink the coffee and come into the Wisdom Cafe and share your ideas. That would be my, my best suggestion. Well, thank you very Thanks much, Paul. Thank you.